investment, principles of money, principles of success. Many things in life have principles. So, in sowing, there are principles. And one of the principles is that the principle, the sowing and reaping applies to all people. It's not just for St. Franciscans, it's not just for Christians, not for Muslims, not for Africans, Europeans only, everywhere. It is a universal uh, concept that you sow and then you reap. So it applies to all people. The second principle about sowing is that you reap what you sow. Kind of straightforward. You reap what you sow. And this is basically in two dimensions. One, you reap the kind of thing that you sow. If you sow groundnuts, you reap groundnuts. You don't reap beans. If you sow oranges, you reap oranges. You don't. So in a way, they, that's what they mean, you reap what you sow. But on another level, it says, whatever you are sowing, whatever you are doing, eventually there will be outcomes. It will eventually give birth and you will reap. So that is on another level that the, the, the fact of sowing results in uh, reaping. Those are two principles. It applies to all. You reap what you sow. The third principle, you always reap more than you have sown. You reap more because the seed multiplies, supposed to multiply, and most times, thankfully, it will uh, multiply. You reap more than you sow. And the last principle I want to tell you about sowing later than you sow. You sow today, you expect to reap tomorrow, next week, next month, or next year. Unless somebody can tell me here where you first reap and then you sow. I have not come across that. But of course you know many people want to, <laughs> they want to reap. Uh, you cannot reap what you have not sown. That is a common saying. And therefore the harvest depends on when and where you sow. And uh, the parable of the sower says, when you sow and uh, where. So farmers know when the season is for planting. And if you want to maximize your harvest, you have to sow at a particular time. So where I come from, we grow millet, but lately we are interested in growing rice. Now rice likes water, swamps. So if you want rice, a bountiful harvest. You have to look for swamps near the water. That is why I'm saying harvest depends on when and where you sow. So there is a question of timing as well. We have defined sowing and seen the principles. How about the marketplace? Because our topic for today is sowing in the marketplace. So now I did a bit of a history of what the marketplace from biblical times and uh, it says that uh, marketplace was a large public open space. You know, for a moment, forget about your offices and the malls and all. Before all these were there, the marketplace was that one large public and open place. And people would go there dancing and uh, playing, which has been replaced by theaters and stadia. Idlers would go there looking for jobs or what to do or maybe still. Today we have Employment Bureau. Thank you. I think this one was, uh, uh, I think if it was a car, they say, okupipira, pulling. So, but the marketplace, uh, we had uh, goods and services traded there what you do in markets and malls, and lately you do it on online. You know, Jumia, Amazon, and all. You can see how the marketplace is getting transformed. And then uh, you had sick people looking for healing, looking for the herbalists and so on. Today, sick people go to the hospitals, the pharmacies. Those are the modern workplaces. 
And then in that public open square, you had politicians and uh, religious people going to, you know, ply their trade, speaking and convincing and debating. It's done here in church, it's done in parliament, it's done in uh, Chimeza, on the airwaves. And then, of course, that large open public square, you also had disputes being settled. You saw our couple here. They had a dispute and they needed to bring it to his worship. But today, yeah, we have the police, we have prisons, we have the army, we have the courts that have taken over. So that is what the marketplace is. Previously, one geographical place. Now it is represented by uh, many, many modern things. And the marketplace has challenges, as you have seen. This courtroom was the marketplace for his worship and the secretary and all. And the people had come to seek a uh, resolution of their dispute. I can summarize the challenges of the marketplace in uh, three uh, simple complex, I should not say simple, complex things. And they were very well represented in the drama in the skit, which I had no hand in putting together, but uh, God moves in a mysterious way. Biggest, one of the biggest challenges of the marketplace, money. Money, kit, kidogo, whatever you call it, facilitation, brown envelope. Ah, they were offering 400 million. In fact, at election time, there are people who do monitoring and they were able to break down what the price of a vote is in bribery. And they said the price has been growing. At the beginning, when we started electing, uh, the price was like 100 shillings per vote. But this past election, the cost of a vote has gone so high. You know, when I say cost, it is not even, a, you know, it is not a legitimate cost. But you know this thing of uh, you need to facilitate to, and so on. So money is a very, very big challenge in the marketplace. Second challenge, marketplace, you saw, sex. Sex is a big, big challenge in the marketplace. And you saw part of it here. And the final challenge in the marketplace is power. People want to accumulate power, and they say power corrupts and absolute power corrupts. Of course, if you have never been in a situation where you handled power, you dealt with you wonder how can power be a challenge. But you know what brought down our gentleman at the end? It was power telling him, my dad is powerful, he can bring you up or down. And he succumbed. So somebody called Richard Foster wrote a book called Money, Sex, and Power. If you haven't read it, please read it. It will tell you the ins and outs and how these play out in the world and how you need to handle them as a Christian. Because we, we deal with the same things. We have money, we deal with money, we look for money. But there are legitimate and good ways of doing that. Uh, sex and that kind of thing, but there are legitimate ways and things too. Christians have power. The chaplain has power, you know. But that power can be abused, can be misused. Sex can be abused and misused. Money can be abused and misused. Those are the three big ones in the marketplace. And uh, thank you, the kid people, for exemplifying it so, so, so clearly. And what you saw happens a lot in workplaces, different degrees. And that is why we need to know about sowing in the marketplace. What do we do? So the challenges, as we have seen, I, I can just break them down for you. I come from the just law and order sector, and that takes the police, it takes the prisons, the prosecutions, the courts, and uh, you know we've had a lot of issues there. You know we had corruption in the Gavi scandal, or OPM, Office of the Prime Minister. We had uh, ghost soldiers. We had junk helicopters, all are issues of corruption. And another challenge that is real in the marketplace has happened in the just law and order sector, sometimes under my watch, is uh, people get killed. It is uh, life and death matter for some people. Joan Kagezi, who was working under me, was murdered. We're still looking for the killer. 
Andrew Felix Kawesa was spokes Kawesi, spokesperson of the police. Chirumira, uh, General Katumba lately, very recently, people killed his daughter and his uh, driver. So marketplace is a serious, serious arena. And therefore, you need to know what you are doing there, what to do, and when to do it, and the solutions to this. One of the things is you need to know that you are a seed. God has sown you as a seed, and that you are also sowing seeds to put things in proper perspective. So, we are talking about God, and I would like to tell you that God created the marketplace. You know, things God created, human beings try to distort, to abuse, to counterfeit. So, this marketplace we are talking about was created by God. And God, therefore, is interested in the marketplace. Thirdly, God is actually involved in the marketplace. And fourthly, he is invested. So you see, interested is like, okay, let me spectate. But he is invested in the marketplace. And he is intentional about the marketplace. Therefore, he audits, he evaluates, he inspects the marketplace. And finally, thankfully, God redeems the marketplace. God redeems the marketplace. So it's not a hopeless situation. God redeems the marketplace. But he redeems the marketplace through us, through you, the seeds that he has sown. And the passage that read from the scripture is that you are the light of the world. As a seed, your other responsibility is to be the light. You are the light of the marketplace. And therefore, you cannot afford not to shine or to grow dim. Thankfully, we have examples of people who are in the marketplace before us. And that passage in Daniel 6, maybe Daniel is the best representative of a seed in the marketplace and how you can face all the challenges, be able to withstand. He's an example of integrity. The scripture said, King Darius picked him to pretend over. As you know, kings, of course, are interested in uh, good governance, in ensuring that there's smooth administration, so King Darius saw Daniel and realized this is a person who will further my interest, my kingdom. So Daniel was an exemplary person. There was no corruption in him. That is what he's saying. And he was not negligent. So the solution of being a seed, powerful seed, useful seed in the marketplace is you must be a person of integrity. Don't involve yourself in corruption. It's possible. Joseph, Daniel, and many other people. It's possible not to be involved in uh, corruption. It is also possible not to be negligent. And what does it mean when they say he was not negligent? There are many negligent people in the marketplace. They come late. You know, timekeeping is a big, big problem in our country especially. You make an appointment with somebody... For 9 o'clock, they come, if they come, 10, 11. Some people have the audacity, you are supposed to meet at 9, they come at 2. Really? This is negligence of the highest order. Uh, <clears throat> presentation. I must say you are all looking very presentable, very smart. Let's give ourselves a hand clap. Yes, but people sometimes go to work or to interviews. I... Uh, used to work at Uganda Revenue Authority, and uh, I a few times was given opportunity to interview young people coming in to join, and uh, it was amazing, because when you are going for interviews in most places, they will not tell you what is the dress code, but do they need to tell you dress code when you are going to an interview? You would imagine it is obvious. So I saw people coming in t-shirts, I actually love t-shirts, but you don't go for an interview in a t-shirt unless you are interviewing for coach of cranes or something. And then uh, people would come in sandals. I also love sandals. I go to church in sandals when I'm not the preacher. And uh, you know balancing? I don't see it much these days. Maybe I don't hang out too much with young people. Balancing, something called balancing. But the worst bit about uh, <coughs> negligence was uh, 
presentation of documents. So this young man had the cavera, the black ones, you know the original cavera is black, had put in his testimonials and had not checked on them, I think, for a year. And the cockroaches and rats had had a buffet of his papers, you know, O-level certificate, A-level university. So they had a buffet of his uh, testimonials. And so they were fragments, you know, those things which he... So we said, oh, present your credentials. And uh, he pulls them out and the cloud of dust and all that thing engulfs the interviewers and we all take cover. So we quickly say, no, it's okay, you can put them back. Before, because nobody wants to come near that kind of negligence. I can tell you that uh, that young man did not get the job and you cannot blame the interviewers because there's something called the first impression. It's possible those testimonials were first class degrees. But we don't know because, no, 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 we didn't want to go beyond a certain point with him. So that is negligence, really. I mean, other people are coming. You say, present your papers, and they are giving you something like this. And you are bringing, uh, so that is negligence. And I think that's part of what they are saying. David Daniel was not negligent. People can be negligent in the marketplace. Please don't be one of those. Integrity. I, I mean, integrity is many, many things in the workplace. That means you are not corrupt. You are ethical about time. You are ethical with your co-workers and your, your bosses. You are ethical in the way you conduct themselves, yourselves. You handle uh, allowances, you know. Money has become a very, very big problem. You know, there is a saying that God made man and man made money, blah, blah, blah. It seems it has come to pass in Uganda. Money is making people go completely wild and unreasonable. You don't have to be one of them. But what can make you stand out? What is it that can distinguish you as a seed that has been sown? And then you also sow seeds that will last a lifetime in the workplace, in the marketplace, that will be worthy of talking about like Daniel. You need to first of all ask yourself some questions. One is, who am I? Who are you? Two, why are you here? Why are you here at St. Francis in Uganda? Why are you in the world at all? Where are you going? And what are you going to do to get there? You need to battle with those questions. They will help you then know who you are in the workplace and they will give you a perspective. Because some people I'm sure wake up to go to work but they don't know why they are going to work. Okay, at the end of the month you have to earn so you are going to work so that you can earn. But that is really a very shallow way and uh, can be a frustrating way of looking at the marketplace. Just a place you go to earn a living, a place you go to spend time, a place you go to hang out with other people. No, once you ask yourself, who am I? Am I just uh, somebody was quoted to have said in Changwanzi that uh, somebody is just a biological substance? Are you just a biological substance? A big one, bigger than, uh, you know, a snail and all, but you are in the same Oh, are you fearfully and wonderfully made and put here on earth to do something? You need to wrestle with the question of who are you and why are you here at this particular time? Then you'll be able to know why you are in a particular marketplace or why you need to leave a particular marketplace and go to another. There is a man called uh, Charles Colson. He was a uh, an advisor to American President Richard Nixon, who then, of course, you know, Richard Nixon was impeached because of some misconduct, negligence, the one we are talking about. So this negligence runs from bottom, can run from bottom to top. So when uh, the trials came, it was found out that Charles Colson was one of the people who were influential 
in helping Nixon do the bad things that he did. So he was jailed. I was telling Reverend Nixon that uh, there is a saying in your atament of mankind. So we have uh, medical people in the marketplace, we have legal people, we have clergy, various marketplaces. I can tell you that people were dying from infections and those kinds of things until somebody in the marketplace invented something called penicillin. Penicillin was the original thing that helped to deal with infections and cure many people. We are in the world to help improve and uh, uplift the standards of living of people in our different marketplaces. The invention of penicillin caused the revolution in the medical world. Planes were invented by somebody in the marketplace who realized he was here to contribute to the marketplace. Phones, you know, phones and computers. So when I was doing P7, uh, you know, Reverend Onesimus alluded to the name Michael and Mike. So I was baptized in the Anglican church as Michael. Now, when I did P7, my dad was not happy with the results I had got, which were taking me to a day school, Mbale SS, and that's how I happened to be in Mbale at that time and meet the Lord. The crisis is a terrible thing to waste during my crisis there. But when I was to repeat, they told me, the computer, there is a computer, a computer, that was a new name. You know, you people are using the word computer like you were born with it. For us, computer was something uh, mysterious. We were hearing the word computer for the first time and in the village, therefore, it was even worse. But they told us, it's in Kampala, it is in a big room like this chapel, and it is there to see who is repeating. It doesn't allow people to repeat. But you know people always have solutions. They said, but you can beat that computer by changing your name a little. And at that time, there was somebody called Power Mike. Anybody heard about Power Mike? Ah, you are all young people. Power Mike, you can Google him. He was a man who was so strong. He could use his teeth and prevent a plane from flying, just with a tie to a rope. And a... So he was a powerful, powerful man. And I liked the name Mike. So I changed from Michael to Mike partly to beat the computer, but partly Mike sounds, uh, you know, a cool name. <laughs> so, but later I found out that actually there was a computer in Crested Towers there occupying a very big machine. What I've been told by people who work in that area, that the memory you have on your phone now is a hundred times more powerful than that computer had. It can store so many things. So somebody in the marketplace was not sleeping, was multiplying the seed that the Lord had put in their brain, in their skills. And we have mobile phones now. When we were dating with my wife, she was in the U.S., she had gone to study, and uh, there was no, fo no mobile phone, so there was no WhatsApp. So if uh, we wanted to communicate, now, uh, you people, there was something called air mail. Air mail was a special envelope. You wrote me, I responded. Until the letter then made its way around the world and came two months later, and I said, okay, now I can see what she was saying. <laughs> now you guys who are dating and so on instantaneously, whether here in Ukraine, in America, you are just, you know, get place some people really doing what they are supposed to do to transform society and make life better. Music, music has also transformed. You know, when we were young, Christmas, there were songs like Chitengi Ya Susuku. It was never Christmas without uh, Chitengi Ya Susuku. And uh, Kakolele, Viva Christmas. And the songs lasted for like 20 years. They were the hits. Now, today you hear a song, tomorrow is another one. Then, hey, you people, how do you cope? So what is the trending song and you don't know, but... The turnover is so high. The marketplace has transformed. People are, are working very hard and uh, improving in some aspect. Of course, there are some aspects of the marketplace today which are not uh, so good. So we've talked about sowing. We've talked about the marketplace. How about reaping? We said you reap what you sow. 
So we talk about reaping and we talked about actions and uh, outcomes. Joseph and Daniel, you know, Joseph was made prime minister because he had sown. You remember he, Potiphar's wife, he resisted many things. He resisted his, and so on. Eventually, he was made prime minister. So there is reaping of sown in the right places, at the right time, in the right attitude. You can reap became a prime minister. So you can get a promotion in the workplace. Daniel, he was, uh, you know, promoted to become the chief administrator. But you can also reap a reputation, a good reputation. You can reap integrity, credibility, and trust. I don't know if these things are important to you. Does it matter that people trust you? <laughs> Is it important? <laughs> I may be talking and you are saying, but who cares about trust? Who cares about reputation? These are very, very important things. So, people recruiting in places. My wife, is, a, as you heard, teaches, but they go to her and say, we want the top five but tell us also about their character. So, what I'm saying is if you are skilled and uh, do your work well, and you also have a reputation, you see there is a lot of unemployment. But I can tell you there are people who, who say, which unemployment? Because people are fighting for them. <laughs> you may not believe it. There, there are people who are saying, which unemployment are they talking about? Because they have sown and uh, because they're hiring people every year. Every, every year people die, retire, and, um, uh, businesses come up. So they're hiring. But they are looking for people in the marketplace who will add value. That's why we talk about reputation, integrity, credibility, trust. Nobody wants to hire somebody they will not trust with their money, with their workplace, with their property. You will reap peace of mind. Now, you will never know peace of mind properly if you, if you have not known absence of peace of mind. Absence of peace of mind is a terrible thing. You become restless, you become stressed, and many people run mad because of absence of peace of mind. Peace of mind is a gift from the Lord, and you should uh, aspire to have peace of mind. It's one of the things you reap as a result of sowing well in the marketplace. But the things we look for, material stuff, you know, money, cars, houses, you've heard about arcades. They will, you know, the Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. It's, it's not fiction. It's not uh, building castles in the air. It is the truth. All these things will be added to you. Let me tell you a small story about my foot. So I have a slightly bigger foot than average. So I uh, used to have a big problem finding the right kind of shoes, right from senior one. And you know there were a few shoes then. Even uh, Now you can go here and there. So I, I really struggled to get shoes. Shoes were a big problem. And I even told God, God, will I wear a shoe which fits me? You know, I would wear those and they are squeezing me. And uh, as soon as I get somewhere, I... So when I went to the U.S., I went to a shoe shop. And for the first time in my life, I found a shoe which was bigger than my foot. <laughs> I put in and the shoe was big. Size 25, I said, wow. So my wife usually teases me that uh, I'm the only man who has more shoes than his wife. Because once I realized that I can now buy shoes, my size, I can find them. Now, people now know about my foot. It's not really big, but uh, you know how people are. So they get a shoe and say, ah, Mike, this is your size, please. So I have many pairs of shoes, and uh, many of them given to me. It says, no, this is your size, this is your size, and so on. 
I'm telling you this because uh, of the other point that material stuff. <laughs> At one point you think it's uh, now shoes come to me. They look for me shoes now. And it's a, it's, it's a small thing in the general scheme of things. But when you are at a certain age, you think, will I ever wear a shoe which fits me? And the same for cars, for houses, all these things, question of time, so properly. Be the seed that you are meant to be by God. Daniel and Joseph. Yes, I've been young and now I'm older. I can testify that it's just a question of time and uh, you are doing the right thing, you'll be spoiled for choice. Glorifying God is something that you reap from this. And again, is glorifying God something important for you? Daniel was put in the lion's den. At the end of it, the king, <laughs> absence of peace of mind. The king put Daniel in the lion's den, but he did not have peace of mind. He did not sleep. He kept checking. And in the morning, they took him out and Daniel was alive and the king said, this is an order. Everybody in the kingdom will worship the God of Daniel. <laughs> what a harvest. What a harvest. What a seed. What a seed. Uh, my wife is from Fort Porto uh, and uh, they taught me a word called embivo. Embivo is a uh, special kind of seed, hybrid, very, very nice. So Daniel was a Bible of sorts, special seed. He made the king say, everybody else, there was uh, this evangelism and people preaching and a few people would come to the Lord. Daniel, by one action, the king proclaimed, all of you, we now don't need any more preachers. All of you just believe. He glorified God and Joseph the same. This is harvest, bountiful harvest, and that is what, by being the right kind of seed. Finally, about reaping, there is a bad part which as human beings we don't want. Daniel was thrown into the lion's den. And we don't know the explanation how the lions spared him. Lions don't usually spare beef that easily, but Daniel lived to tell the tale. Joseph was thrown into the dungeon for, you know, accused by no other but by the Potiphar's wife. There is suffering as part of the package. There can be persecution. There can be death as the ultimate. You know, St. Stephen, our Lord Jesus Christ himself was killed as the ultimate price to pay as a harvest for being the kind of seed that is sown. You should be prepared for this. Thankfully, most of you will not test it, but once in a while, people pay with, the, with their lives. Don't be surprised, and uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, German theologian, uh, professor, distinguished character, in people also, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, you can look him up. He wrote a book which says, the title, When Christ Calls a Man, He Bids Him to Come and Die. He went for the jugular. He says, ultimately, when you are looking at what you can harvest out of uh, sowing in the marketplace as a Christian, ultimately, it could end in death. And indeed, Bonhoeffer was uh, killed by Hitler. He, but before that, he had written the book for us to know that. And he had, uh, you know, travailed about these issues. And know that going against the system, going against the grain, means you can attract the worst kind of penalty. In conclusion, the marketplace, as I told you, there will be struggles. So I was a resident judge in, uh, in Masaka, <coughs> and Fort Porto. In Masaka, uh, when I went, I had just been at Uganda Revenue Authority, I was secretary to the management committee, and uh, Alain Kajina, my boss, and one day she came and said, uh, we are phasing out paper from the boardroom, everything will be computerized. And as the secretary of the committee, therefore, I 
realized this message was personally aimed at me, that I was no longer going to write minutes. They had to be on the computer. <clears throat> so I took a crash program in uh, taking minutes uh, on laptop. So uh, I made some progress, and uh, paper was phased out, and uh, I survived, thank God. So when I went to Masaka, I had my laptop, and so I said, uh, instead of writing as the lawyers talk and everything, I could actually type by the end of the court session, I have the transcript ready, and then I can even write my judgment and deliver. I will expedite justice, all these, uh, you know? And you would expect that uh, everybody would be embracing and hugging me and saying, bravo, good job. <laughs> so the first challenge was that uh, power was going every two hours. And then uh, my laptop would shut down in the middle. So I said, but there's something called a generator. Why don't we ask headquarters to send us a generator? They said, there's a very big generator here. It can even power the whole town. So I said, okay, so why don't we switch it on? Oh, there's a problem of fuel. Okay, so why don't we ask for more fuel since we know this problem? So many, you know, when you are, <laughs> you should ask questions when you're in a certain position. And uh, you'll be amazed at the answers, the excuses, and all. So I kept asking until they said, there's somebody called office supervisor who is in charge of all that. I said, call me the office supervisor. We talked that day she was in Kampala. She had gone with the key. We could not put fuel because I was willing to get some money from my pocket and buy fuel. But the office supervisor had the key and she was away. So the next day, we called her and said uh, this and the other. So she bought some fuel put in, but, the, you know. So I called her and said, uh, this is what we are going to do. You are going to give a copy of that key to my bodyguard, so we'll have access. So when we fuel runs out and you are busy with other things, we'll put in fuel. That was a big problem. You know people and keys, you know control, you don't want anybody else to have a copy, but eventually... I got the key and said, whenever, let's have fuel. So that when power goes, we do the work. Now, so people told me, the office supervisor is so annoyed with you. Can you imagine somebody annoyed with me for trying? Sometimes uh, <laughs> improvements and making things run smoother will attract a kind of backlash you don't expect. It's because people don't know better one, but two, they're invested. Somebody maybe was making some difference of that, uh, you know, fuel, who knows what else. Power, you know, power of having the key being the only one. I was interfering with power. But you should be able to innovate. You should be able to take a stand. You should be able to do the right thing at whatever price. And that's why I told you that over time, the marketplace has been improving because people have taken a stand and they said it's behaving like, <laughs> like an ordinary member of staff. So I say, can I bring it to your attention? You are a leader. You are the one supposed to come up with solutions. You are actually supposed to help me solve problems. So can you give me proposals? You have pro presented the challenge. Give me possible scenarios. of. And he was surprised that he was a leader. That is uh, a terrible thing. That is, uh, and it happens over and over. People who you think should, are leaders and should know they are leaders, either they don't know or they are completely behaving like the last person down. Please take your leadership position. When you are in the marketplace, you are either influencing the marketplace or the marketplace is influencing you. There is no reason why. A child of God, a Christian, comes to St. Francis Chapel, sits at the feet of Reverend Onesimus, should be influenced negatively by a young lady for money, for sex, for power. You are the one supposed to influence. So you know what he was supposed to say? Get out of, and she, he had said, but he was not firm enough. You can't, you have to influence. 
Put your stamp on the workplace, on the marketplace. That is why you are there. You be the seed that we could be proud of. So, where is your marketplace? What are you doing in the marketplace? What is your contribution? Are you going to be a statistic? 50% of people in the marketplace are corrupt. Are you part of the 50%? But we learned that you are the light of the marketplace and you should not put yourself under the lamp, under the, the table. Stamp your culture and influence on the marketplace. That's what you were created for. Sown by the Lord and you are sowing other seeds. I would like to ask somebody to read for us Psalms 37, verses 3 to 7, and then we'll end. Okay, it is highlighted up there. Trust in the Lord and do good. <clears throat> Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will do this. He will make your righteousness shine like the dawn. The justice of your cause like the moon day shine. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when men succeed in their ways, when they carry out their schemes. May the Lord bless you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Let's appreciate him once again. Now we can appreciate our father who has used him to speak to us. Thank you very, very much. Let us now joyfully bring our gifts to the Lord.
Father, we thank you for you're a great and mighty God. Thank you for speaking to us so powerfully this morning. And your spirit is hovering over our souls, convicting us of our lost condition, of negligence, of uh, failure to stand as Men and women, you are placed in various places of work to shine for you as light to the world, as the salt of the earth. There has been compromise. Lord, we pray for mercy. We ask for your forgiveness. You're the God of the second chance. And so we offer our hearts to you. We have also given you some money, part of which you've given us. May it represent the thanksgiving offering of our hearts because of your goodness. Lord, indeed, you are saying to us as a church, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto us. So, Lord, continue to meet each one of us at our various points of need. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please be seated for a minute or two. It's been such a powerful message. And uh, the challenges of the marketplace are threefold. Money, sex, and power. I don't know which one comes first. Uh, but... Um, Sometimes when you give man power, that's when you, you test the, the, his character. If you want to test the, the real character of man, give him power. And uh, to some, it is money. When you get money, I think money is, is power also. I've seen people who are not really educated. They have never been to university, but have money. Uh, and the, when they are speaking, even in broken English, they, they are very confident. <laughs> you know? Uh, and others use sex as a means to uh, power and uh, money. But, but these are, these are co they cut across and they affect us all. But we thank God that there are men and women of integrity uh, who have the, they are placed, they are positioned to uh, demand to access these things. They are positioned to access these things, but they have said no. 
because that's what integrity is about. And, and you're one of them, uh, just uh, my Lord, uh, Justice Chibita. And uh, you can be one of them. Amen? You can be one of them. So uh, do not be in a hurry to reap before you sow. You, you graduate, and in one year, you want to build a house with wings. <laughs> Have you seen those houses? Yeah, what, what a powerful, what a powerful message. I, I have seen uh, one young lady, I will not embarrass her, um, but I've seen her here. She attended 7 o'clock service, but decided to have another portion. <laughs> so thank you for, for coming. I can see uh, we have, uh, there was even a provision of uh, putting ch chairs in the aisles, uh, but you're still 200 anyway. You're still 200. <laughs> We have a justice here who may, we are still 200, those of you who are, who are watching. Uh, but there is, I believe God wants to bless somebody. In a, when, when you receive a message like this, it's important to respond to it. Otherwise, you're going to leave this place and you'll be saying, the man has preached. You'll say, what has he preached? The man has spoken. So I believe God wants to bless somebody. Uh, to those who believed and those who accepted, there is, there's something about listening, but there is another thing. It's one thing to listen, it's another to respond to the message. And uh, I want to invite people that are saying, I want to respond to this message by asking the Lord to use me to sow righteousness in the marketplace. You know you are, but first let me invite the, the lawyers. If you know you're a student of law or you're a lawyer, please come here uh, quickly because I am going to ask justice to pray for you. If you know you're a lawyer, I, I thought by now you'd be here. Uh, from the garage, come with your property. Don't leave your phone behind. There could be some wrongdoers. And then, and then you are saying, I want to be one of those who will stand tall in the marketplace as the light of the world. I know there are going to be these forces, but I will stand for the Lord. Please, you come as well and join them as we sing, please. As we sing, quickly, quickly, we don't have a lot of time. Uh, Lord, just come. I give you my heart. Come, come, come quickly, come quickly. Social distance. And then the man of God is going to pray for you. Hallelujah. Every breath that I take, every moment I wait, Lord, have your way. Lord, I give you my heart. You're saying I want to make a difference in the marketplace. This is your time. I want to sow righteousness in the marketplace. Come for prayer. us to ask ourselves, who are we and why are we here? And we thank you for sowing into us, sowing us as seeds, Lord. And as we continue to propagate ourselves as seeds, 
May we take into consideration that parable you told us. May we be seed that falls on fertile ground. And may we be seed that will continually ensure that uh, the weeds and the cares of the world don't choke us. Thank you for those that have been able to come here this morning, those standing. And we thank you for the law, for the legal profession. We know the law can be abused and has been used to support slave trade, support apartheid and segregation, to oppress women. But we know that the law is a powerful instrument of transformation of society and the marketplace. Indeed, it is the law which was put in place to end slave trade and slavery, to end discrimination and segregation, to strike down apartheid. Lord, now these ones who have come before you, those who are studying the law, who like to study the law, who are in positions of leadership, may you help them to claim that position of leadership and be able to influence the marketplace, influence the society, influence the places where you have put them. May they be reminded that they are seeds that have been sown and that they germinated in fertile ground. May they continue propagating the seed of righteousness, of holiness, of integrity, of non-negligence like Daniel, Lord. May they stand tall, reclaim positions of leadership. Let them not be tails but heads as they were intended to be. Lord, speak to them, empower them, strengthen them, equip them and help them to go and stamp their authority and their culture, your culture, in the marketplace at whatever places they are. Wherever they are, in this college, in the workplace, that is their marketplace, and you have put them there. Let them realize this fact and take leadership there. Thank you, Lord, because you empower us, you equip us. You are interested and invested in the marketplace. Use them, use us to redeem the marketplace in we pray and ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. And Lord, we thank you for the power of your word. And that you have used your servant, Mike, not just to give information, but impartation to all these professionals and the people you have called and placed in different uh, worlds of work and influence. And so we pray that, Lord, you dismiss each one of us with your heavenly blessing, that we will go out as men and women determined to be the light of the world, to be influencers. We thank you because when you prayed for your disciples, you prayed, you said, Father, I pray. I do not pray that you would take them out of the world, but that you would preserve them. Preserve them, Lord, in the world. They are in the world, but they are not of the world. And indeed, even when you went in the grave, you were in the grave, but the grave was not in you. And so make us distinguished people that we will stand tall like a tall tree in a forest and that people will make us their points of reference and say, I want to be like lawyer so-and-so. I want to be like doctor so-and-so. I want to be like that teacher, that businessman, that banker, that, that engineer. Lord, we can make a difference in the world. We pray that we will go out with that determination and favor. And so, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord shine his face upon you and be gracious to you. May you go out as Christians who happen to be lawyers, Christians who happen to be teachers, Christians who happen to be whatever field God has called you to. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you, beloved, and remain with you all now and forever and ever. And God's people said, Amen and Amen. Let us give the Lord a powerful shout of praise. Hallelujah. Amen.
Well, to God be the glory. Thank you very much, uh, Justice, and uh, your family for bringing such a powerful word to us. Let us appreciate the praise team, the ushers, and everyone. And, and uh, thank you all for uh, worshiping with us online, and to God be all the glory. Let us now go out into the world to love and serve the Lord. Amen. Amen. God bless you, and have a fruitful week ahead of you. Oh, 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 he's the God of miracles, hallelujah, say, oh, hey, oh, hey. oh, hey, oh, hey, oh, he's the God of miracles, hallelujah, sing it again, say, oh, hey, oh, hey, oh, oh, hey, oh, he's the God of miracles, hallelujah, Oh, 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 he's the God of miracles, hallelujah. Oh, 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 he's the God of miracles, hallelujah. We serve a miracle-working God, and it's nothing too hard for him. When he speaks, 